Hello again, friends. Uh, here we are now at, in a sense, what is the climax of the search for a nonviolent future, because we talk about the climactic campaign in the most iconic uh, episode or struggle in modern nonviolent history, that struggle being the Indian freedom struggle and that climactic campaign happening in the early spring of 1930, which was the SALT Satyagraha. Uh, the issue being that uh, British monopolized the manufacture of salt, even though you had a couple thousand miles of coastline. And it was like a classic case of the way colonialism works. You take away a resource that people have used for millennia, in this case, and say, no, we have to manufacture it for you, sell it back to you at a big price and make a profit. And at this time, there was a cartoon that showed a, an enormous cow with its head in India and its udders in Britain. So the feeding in India and getting all those resources drained. So uh, it was in many ways an iconic campaign and it illustrates so many things, a couple of which uh, I didn't even work into the book at that time. One of the things that it does represent very nicely is what we call a nonviolent moment. A nonviolent moment is when a nonviolent campaign has been building and producing a response from oppressive actors. And it always seems to be the case that at some point, and you never can really predict what, when, those two things go head to head. And you really see what the nonviolence is made of and what the violence is made of. And I need hardly say that if you get everything working very cleanly, it will almost always be the case that the nonviolence will both work and work. That is, it'll get what you want right then in the immediate uh, environment, and it'll also produce much better results. So uh, the long march uh, to the sea from Gandhi's ashram down to Dandin, 12-day uh, march, where thousands and thousands of people accumulate behind him. He picks up a fistful of salt from the sea and declares India is free. Turns out it was not an exaggeration. Now, the interesting thing is it didn't work hardly at all. The salt laws stayed in place. Uh, almost nothing happened except so many people being put in jail. But the world realized, partly thanks to an American journalist who was there, that uh, India was now free. So let me now add a couple of other things uh, that uh, this event represents. One of them is that it was what I call a stealth action. That is, <clears throat> Gandhi and his followers were able to see something in the dynamic of their situation which the opponent could not see. And they were able to do something which the opponent would not recognize was dangerous to them until it was too late. So you literally have a statement by the then Viceroy, Lord Irwin, who he wires back to London saying, I am not losing any sleep over the SALT campaign. Very, very self-assured and totally wrong. He ended up losing the entire empire over that campaign. Because by the time they uh, reacted, the campaign had gotten so huge that they had to undergo what we call a paradox of repression. So they call in this, in CIA language, this is called blowback. You do something to achieve one result, some violent thing, and it, it blows back in your face. Well, uh, that we call it in nonviolent terms, the paradox of repression. So it illustrates a nonviolent moment, it illustrates a stealth campaign, and it illustrate, illustrates what I now call stage two of constructive action. Stage one constructive action is action which is non-confrontational and does not have any obvious immediate result in creating a response from the government, though the oppressive regime. And in this case, a good illustration of that was the Charka, the spinning campaign. It was completely non-confrontational, had really millions of people doing it. It was undercutting the basis of the British regime 
but it was completely illegal and they, they didn't know it was coming at all. But in the Salt Satyagraha, you escalate this to where the opposition becomes clear and uh, you're actually violating the law. So that is uh, what they did and if you've seen the Gandhi film, it was very, very accurate in that representation and very accurate in what the journalist Webb Miller wired, uh, phoned back to his newspaper. Now we also talk about another event uh, in this section which is of tremendous importance for us in nonviolence, which is the Rosenstrasse prison demonstration where a couple thousand uh, Jewish or non-Jewish uh, wives protesting against the Gestapo actually rescued their Jewish husbands from detention. So I just recommend that you go back and read that. Uh, I do not recommend that you see the recent film that was made about it because as in most uh, filmic uh, commercial large-scale productions, they missed the point. They couldn't believe that nonviolence actually did anything. But uh, read about it and there's a wonderful book called uh, Revolution of the Heart by Nathan Stoltzfus, which will give you some of the full dimensions. And if anybody asks you, and they will, uh, well, nonviolence would never have worked against Hitler. Simply whip out page 95 or wherever we are and say, no, as a matter of fact, it worked very well against Hitler because the Fuhrer himself refused to make a decision and the German propaganda machine had no response and they finally had to release those men and that saved the lives of tens of thousands of people across Europe. So until next time, that, uh, that is what I think we can mostly get out of this lesson that when people say nonviolence wouldn't have worked against Hitler, you say, no, nope, pardon me, it was rarely tried and when it did, even at a very low level, it worked brilliantly.